people's attention, I think we'll, uh, we'll get started with our final plenary for the conference. I have the honor of uh, introducing our speaker, uh, Dr. Jeff Klein. Uh, and actually, I was supposed to mention before I started that we have a, a Twitter moderator, uh, Teresa Chan, at Teresa Chan MD. Uh, if people have questions or want to tweet things, I'm not actually sure what a Twitter is, but I know it's important because uh, where would Donald Trump be without one? Um, so, Jeff Klein uh, worked in North Carolina, has relocated to uh, Indiana. He's an emergency physician, a prolific pulmonary embolism researcher. Uh, he's the editor-in-chief of Academic Emergency Medicine, uh, and he's an icon in our field. Probably most of you are going to be familiar with Jeff uh, because of the PERC rule. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem when you create something that is so big and so outstanding, sometimes it can al almost come back and kind of overwhelm the way that people look at you. And so, you know, if you're Jimmy Page, everywhere you go, people want to hear you play Stairway to Heaven. If you're me, people are always bugging me. They want to talk about the amazing deck that I built in my backyard. And uh, I suspect if you're Jeff Klein, people you know, want to talk about PE diagnosis and PERC. And uh, so we've, we've decided not to make Jeff play Stairway to Heaven today. Uh, he will be, for those of you who are interested, uh, speaking at the University of Calgary Grand Rounds tomorrow morning. I think that's at 9 o'clock. Is that right, Eddie? Oh, 8.30. Uh, so hang around tomorrow uh, and uh, you get an opportunity to see Jeff again. Today, uh, Dr. Klein will describe a personal and philosophic shift from creating research su success toward creating humanism in how emergency physicians generate diagnostic hypotheses. He will describe how weak empathy can be a root cause of diagnostic error and focus on what we can do at the bedside to improve empathy and reduce cognitive error. So uh, please welcome me in, in welcoming uh, Dr. Klein. <clears throat> Great. <laughs> what a perfect introduction because I did uh, invent the perk rule. And if in my life, it was a relatively small amount of time of research, but it sort of ended up being like writing the song, sort of like who let the dogs out. You know, oh, you're the who let the dogs out guy. <laughs> That's it. But I did some other things. I swear I did. And uh, one of them is to understand the root cause of error at the bedside. And that's really what this talk is about. And I think it's going to be the next 10 years of my research career. And I'm going to try to have you understand sort of my more expansive vision of why cognitive empathy is a key to preventing over-testing and preventing um, medical errors at the bedside. But it's all going to kind of rotate around the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. I think what a lot of us strive for is this concept of clinical wisdom, and I've tried to define it here with the help of some other philosophers and folks that I've read about this, and it's the simultaneous use of intuition as rapid or system one processing, knowledge, it's what we learn in our residencies and our experience, analytical thinking, kind of God-given, technical competence, emotional intelligence to formulate accurate diagnostic hypotheses. At the end of the day, our patients want us to be right, leading to treatment decisions with a high therapeutic index, meaning we do exactly what they need, nothing more, nothing less. What I really want is the patient to walk out of the emergency department and say, I was lucky to get that doctor today. So the themes I'm gonna talk about are diagnostic hypothesis generation, errors, theoretical construct of empathy, and innovations to improve empathy to increase the value of diagnostic imaging in particular, especially around CT, pulmonary angiography for CT scan, or for PE, because that's kind of what I know the best. So my life has been about these Venn diagrams and is trying to get them to overlap better. Patients that um, have no clinically significant PE versus the ones that have PE that should be treated. And the overlap is those that we actually test. And there's not enough overlap right now. There's too many people with PE that are being missed and are dying. And there's way too many people that are getting tested that don't have pulmonary embolism. The same thing goes for a bunch of other diseases too, including 
acute aortic dissection, subarachnoid hemorrhage, other things. So this is a generalizable concept, but PE is the construct. Now, one of the things you'll hear me talk about today is the idea that I think, at least in the United States, we're at equipoise in terms of where we are with missing diagnosis versus over-testing. So this is a, um, a, a sort of a metaphorical diagram that shows you these big red blocks that represent death. The apocalypse, the thing you don't want to do on shift, and that's send a patient out who dies or failed to diagnose a potentially fatal disease. And we think a lot about those, and they have a lot of weight and a lot of power. But right now, at least in the U.S., they're being offset by toxicities associated with three things. One is false positive diagnosis. And in the case of pulmonary embolism, being anticoagulated when you don't need to be anticoagulated and labeled for life as having a thrombosis and developing the downstream effects of that that I call thromboneurosis. Almost everyone that gets diagnosed with pulmonary embolism suffers to some extent from PTSD. The other is radiation exposure, especially in women under age 40, and it increases their risk of breast cancer. And then the third is possibly contrast nephropathy, which we're still trying to sort out. But you don't ever see an M&M where we put um, you know, Dr. Hochberg up on the stand and say, all right, you ordered 100 negative CT scans. You probably killed one person. Nobody ever had that M&M. We always have the M&M for the red boxes. But everyone is more and more wary of the fact that over-testing is a bad thing. So I'm talking about both as medical errors. Now, what's saving and killing patients right now, especially around the area of PE, is not whether or not you use the PERC rule or what iteration of the year's criteria, the um, method of using a higher D-dimer cutoff for a lower pretest probability that Menno Huisman studied and published in Lancet. It's not D-dimer adjustments for age or pregnancy or cancer. Those are not the most important areas where we are missing and over testing for pulmonary embolism. It's the failure to consider the diagnosis appropriately, and it's the failure to trust instinct when I really don't think the patient needs a test, but I psych myself out and order a test anyway. Those are the things that are killing patients right now. It's been said that empathy is on the decline in the United States. I sort of take the opposite bent. I think empathy is on the rise in medicine. You've already had one lecture about it that uh, preceded me by a couple of days. I'm gonna tell you why it's on the rise, because it's the right thing to do to prevent error, and it's the right thing to prevent burnout. Now, this goes back to the concept of something that I've observed over the last 20 years of doing research, and that is emergency physicians are pretty darn good at gestalt decision-making about whether or not they think the patient has pulmonary embolism. They just don't trust themselves. The area under the curve for gestalt reasoning on a visual analog scale of 0 to 100% is always about 0 0.8, a pretty good darn decision rule just asking you, give me a number, 0 to 100% probability this patient has pulmonary embolism. And this has been shown in meta-analyses, this one in Annals of Internal Medicine many years ago by Will Lucasson. It works just as well as structured criteria. It's actually better because you have it in your brain all the time and you can use it for every single patient that you see at the bedside. You don't have to pull out some type of a computer to do it. Now, that is except when it doesn't get the chance to. That means when we don't have the right diagnostic hypothesis generation, the right intuition to say, hmm, I'm going to engage brain and decide yes, no, I think this patient may have pulmonary embolism. And this is a deposition from a patient's family member. Every medical malpractice case that I've ever done, there's been over 100 of them, there's a lot of them in the United States, involves a person who has died from alleged negligence for failure to diagnose pulmonary embolism. This is an archetypal case, and this is the, um, this is the brother of a patient that says, she was just sitting there hyperventilating. He, the doctor, just kind of walked in the room and told her, quote, you need to calm down. He was writing in his chart and talking to the nurse about getting a breathing treatment. He never really even looked at her. This is a theme you will see again and again in medical malpractice cases in the depositions of patients. And I believe the depositions. 
both, but it depend, doesn't matter whether I'm defending the doctor or whether I'm on the plaintiff's side of these cases. I believe this happens again and again. Another thing that happens is symptoms fluctuate. With many fatal diseases, including pulmonary embolism, this is depositions that show you the picture of a patient's symptoms fluctuating. Question, did you talk to him any further about how he was doing, how he was feeling? This is the lawyer asking the spouse of a person who died of pulmonary embolism what the patient was looking like. Sure, several times. Tell me what you recall being said in that regard. He just referred to, you know, he just referred to something's definitely wrong. You know, I mean, he was just breathing, was off, he was dizzy. Sometimes he would get pale for a while and then he, he would get a little color. He would look okay after a while. You could see the panic in his face, but it was just discomfort. And this is something that's key. Was there any change in his condition from during that time that you were there? Off and on, this is talking about in the emergency department. Off and on, I mean, like I said, the breathing would get heavier and deeper. You know, he would turn to one side. You could see him getting pale and sweaty. And then he would tone back down, you know. And then it's, more, it's like what he was saying is the patient's symptoms fluctuate. He would go back to a non-panic state and his breathing would settle. Without empathy, you can miss this. You can walk in and see the patient looking good. And it's about having and establishing the right relationship to get to that information. And this is the heart of that patient who had this massive pulmonary embolism that you can see in that outflow tract of the pulmonary artery there. That's that um, purple mass. So the concept here is about emergency care diagnostic hypothesis generation. And with our average patient, somewhere around 80% of our, 80 to 85% of our hypothesis generation occurs within 30 seconds, maybe a minute, maybe less. And that's the concept of intuition, the so-called system one processing. And then that's followed by analysis. That's taking data, thinking things over, sort of reconstructing our intuition. But so much of it goes on that first initial encounter, looking at the patient's affect, their body posture, and what you know from the monitor and the past medical history that's been told to you. And if you saw the patient that I just mentioned, there could be times when you walk in and see a panicked patient and you know needs testing, or you can see somebody that just looks like they're fine and their status post a panic attack. That leads to the concept of diagnostic error. So here's a guess what I'm thinking question. Out of 100 pulmonary embolism medical malpractice cases alleging failure to diagnose, what percentage included claims about failure or improper use of a decision rule? I've never seen a medical malpractice case allege Perk failed, Wells failed, Geneva failed. It's never about that. On the other hand, how many of them were claims about the failure to ever consider the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism? And this is not an exaggeration. It's 100%. All of them are because we didn't go to the bedside, the docs didn't go to the bedside and generate the right diagnostic hypothesis in almost every case was a failure to develop an empathic relationship. Helen Haskell has this statement, diagnosis is born in a relationship and forms the basis for everything that happens in healthcare. And that's especially true in emergency care where your patient never wanted to see you or never wanted to see me. Almost every other doctor that gets seen by a patient, there's some pre-scheduling or some type of referral or the patients electively deciding to see the patient. We get that one chance to meet the stranger and we have the first 30 seconds to develop trust and empathy and make the patient believe that we care about them. And at the same time, hear the story and not over test. I think a great example of this, Dr. Vink and I were just talking about this, is syncope. Understanding the patient's point of view of syncope is key to not over testing and not overdoing it. You know, many times you go talk to a patient that allegedly passed out and you find out they didn't even pass out. Their eyes were closed. And they, they're telling the resident, I didn't see anything, I couldn't hear anything, I couldn't tell what was going on. But by getting them to settle down and talking with them, you find out they were just squinting their eyes. They might have been laying on the floor and, and, and conscious the entire time. It goes both ways. Recognizing true panic and recognizing panic because of psychic phenomena. So there's two types of error. Type one is the one that's the red box, failure to diagnose. It's highly penalized. There's 
M&Ms about it all day long, everywhere, probably one going on somewhere in Calgary right now. And usually it's a failure of intuition or analysis. There's also type two errors. That's when you say that there's a problem, it's squandering of resources, it is wasteful, it's minimally penalized though, because like I said, at least in the United States, you can order 100 negative CT scans and almost nobody's gonna fuss at you about it. And it's caused largely by normative, normative behavior, fear, and super sense. None of these are logical. How does intuition fail? By biases, labeling of patients, he or she's a drug seeker, trust in the patient, and also just the doctor's intrinsic ability, whereas failure of analysis is usually premature closure, carelessness, even laziness sometimes. Occasionally it's inadequate training or knowledge, but it's usually just taking your eyes off of the wheel, taking your eyes off of the road for just a minute, and that's how a failure of analysis occurs. Now the thing that leads to overtesting, in my opinion and in my research, is primarily normative behavior. And here's a couple of research papers that help back this up. 80% of cardiologists order tests such as cardiac casts because they believe this is what other cardiologists would do under similar circumstances. 80% of all physicians order diagnostic tests they think are worthless because of fear of medical malpractice. Emergency, me emergency physicians will admit that they have a pretest probability of 0% in about 8% of all CT scans they order, at least in the United States. And this is just the ones they'll admit in my research. Also, they admit that about 8% of the patients they put in the chest pain unit have a 0% pretest probability for acute coronary syndrome. It's magical thinking. And think about this for a minute. What drives our thinking? Normative behavior is very powerful. Now, I have a question for you. How many of you drive the posted speed limit? Well, if you're on a 35 mile an hour road and everybody's driving 50 miles an hour, it's gonna be a rare person that drives 35 miles an hour. We conform our behavior to the people that are around us. And the behavior that I've seen occur over the last 20 years in emergency medicine, at least in the United States, continues to creep toward over-testing and checking CT scans as if they were a vital sign. And that leads to this logic. Batman's riding an elephant, and this renders your argument invalid. It's not logic, it's what we think other people want us to do. Because of the use of magical thinking, which is the generation of false beliefs, which is a normal quality of childhood till about age 45, maybe, if you're a male, um, but it should disappear. We should not be using mystical beliefs, but lots of people do in medicine. And the way to overcome these is to get rid of the fear that you're going to be penalized and going to be shunned or disliked by your colleagues or the physician. And this includes the drivers of guilt, which means I made a mistake, that's what M&M's all about, and that's primarily external, but the worst one is shame, that's internal. The biggest fear that physicians have overall is the fear of being shunned by their colleagues. And it still happens today. If someone makes a mistake, we know that there's those running around behind their back saying, did you hear about so-and-so who made this mistake? It's interesting to look at some of the largest stresses that a human being can sustain in terms of cognitive um, stress as measured by psychologists that do this. The worst is the loss of a child, I am told. The second is the law is divorce is, is way up there. But one that's not talked about very often is people that end up having to go into the witness protection program where they actually lose their entire identity, their entire families. Those people often describe the whole process as worse than death. The same thing happened back in the 80s with HIV and the diagnosis of AIDS where it wasn't the physical death, it was the psychological and social death that being diagnosed with AIDS was worse than the actual disease because people lost their entire social structure. And that's what physicians fear and something that we can all do something about just simply by keeping our mouths shut. There's also a good bit of religiosity in this and just the belief that overall if you make a mistake, you're a bad person. Now the theoretical of co construct of empathy as a solution is pretty strong. 
First of all, there's two big types of empathy, and the part that I care about the most for saving lives is cognitive empathy. And this is what I call the concept of open mind. It's the ability to go to the patient who was being described in that medical malpractice case and give them the benefit of the doubt. You might walk into the room and see a patient that looks great and is smiling, but they're telling you about an emergency. And it can be very difficult early in your career, especially in training when you're busy and you're supposed to be putting up the numbers and the, the, the throughput is most important to be able to sit there and get the patient to tell you what really scared them and what was the reason that they came to the emergency department. I like to think of cognitive empathy as the capacity to understand what the patient experienced having an open mind. On the other hand, affective empathy is much more about sharing, understanding the patient's emotions without actually experiencing them yourself. It's what I call open heart. And it's what many patients want because they want you to be able to understand what they felt. And as you get older, and by the way, I love the um, old docs rule posters, because if you look at those, it's talking about a certain wisdom that happens when you get older, as I'm doing, I'm 53, I don't yet qualify as an old doc, but I'm on my way there. And I've shifted from talking purely about mechanical numbers to the fact that this empathic communication is what gets you through a shift and lets you leave a shift and feel stronger than when you walked into a shift. And I was interested in reading all of the things that the old docs had to say that had changed. And the theme really was we did procedures the old fashioned way. We did cricothyrotomies, we did um, central lines on landmarks without ultrasound. It was very procedurally thought of. And I think that that reflects how our specialty is changing and the way that we are going to survive and be important and be correct is to continue to develop our technical skills, the science, the decision rules, but also to develop the way we formulate relationships rapidly and better than anyone else can, and it's becoming more part of our training. That's why I think empathy is on the rise, because our trainers and the people that are really plugged in recognize this is a key thing to making us have lower error and less burnout. My favorite definition of empathy is the one from To Kill a Mockingbird, and it is you never really know a man until you understand things from his or her point of view, until you climb into his or her skin and walk around in it. And I like to think about that again and again. If I feel like I've not had a good interaction with a patient, I try to think of that statement and go back in and say, wait a minute, I did not jump in to this patient's life for just a second. It doesn't take much time. It just takes the willpower to do it. And empathy, by the way, is a personal thing. It's your thing. It is not something that you have to do it my way or some administrator's way or some researcher's way. You develop your own method of doing it. And you may find that empathy for you is walking in and joking with the patient. Our patients really like sense of humor. Or you might pick up the cigarettes and say, what do you think of these? But you need to know what you're doing, you know? You need to be able to figure it out. And with age and with time, your own way of empathy will come through. The dual effect of empathy is to deal with both intuitive and analytical error. With the first part, the upper part of the box, cognitive empathy being an open mind, that allows you to override missteps in terms of in diagnostic intuition that could be wrong. It lets you listen to the patient and say, wait a minute, even though he or she looks good, he or she may have been in a panic a few minutes earlier and I missed it. Remember, pulmonary embolism is a very weird and capricious physiological disease because the clot can sit and park in the pulmonary outflow tract right at the bifurcation of the pulmonary arteries, and it can sit there and wiggle around. And the patient can have motion changes that almost completely obstruct the cardiac output or allow really pretty good flow around this saddle pulmonary embolism. Sometimes even lying down can make it worse or better. And you think the patient's crazy. They're not crazy. They're just being strangulated and choked to death by blood flow that's intermittent. And you might not see it with your eyes. You might not see it on the pulse ox or the, pul or the pulse itself, but the patient will tell you about it, like that medical malpractice case that I mentioned. Down on the lower side is the affect of empathy, and it's basically just being a nice person and understanding the patient's point of view. And as we get older, 
old doc's rule, more of us get the chance or the misfortune of being in the emergency department. I fortunately am healthy, but I've had um, family members that have had to be on the other side. And it's almost mandatory to develop empathy that you have to role play and be on the other side, which is part of how we teach empathy is role playing. And this gets into the value of that first walk in the room and what do you get when you look at the patient and how valuable is it looking at the patient's affect? Because you know what it is, he looks good or he doesn't look good. What's that based on? So much of it is based on looking at the patient's face. I spent a good bit of time trying to dissect this and turn this into a science to understand what are the diagnostic cues that we use on patients' faces. And I'm gonna jump to the end and tell you that it's really pretty difficult to describe in a very tangible, simple way. The way I got interested in this is people, like residents would always ask me, how did you, why did you think that person had pulmonary embolism who you tested it ended up being positive? And my answer always was, this is a person who he or she looked like they were doing their taxes and it ain't tax season. There's a certain degree of worry, distraction, consternation that the patient had that was unexplained by anything else other than an intermittent physiological derangement. So that got me interested. This is slide 31. If we could roll these for a minute. Look at these five women. They happen to all be women. Tell me which one of these has pulmonary embolism. These are research subjects who all gave me their permission to use their slides and their likeness for the teaching for your benefit. Who has PE? Look at the lady up in the right. She's laughing her butt off. They're all looking at a standardized stimulus. It's a humorous stimulus. It's a little dog jumping around and the dog falls into a pool. So we were trying to ask the question, does facial affect vary in response to a standardized stimulus based on disease process. So are you sure who has PE? You got it figured out? Well, I'm gonna tell you everybody's sick. Lady over on the left and the lady over in the upper right-hand corner have PE. The others had problems. The septic patients, in my opinion, looked septic. Now, Helen Rice has been around, Reese, it's spelled, Helen Reese has been around a long time. She's a psychiatrist who studies empathy and training. And I'll show you that her mnemonic called empathy Conveniently, the first two parts of it are about looking at the patient's eye con having eye contact and looking at the patient's facial muscles. Facial affect, recognition, looking at the patient's affect is a key part of establishing and developing the transference and the reciprocity that's required for empathic communication. So a sub-hypothesis that I started working on in about 2009 is that clinicians should look at and interpret their patient's affect and facial expression and use it to generate gestalt pretest probability assessment for life-threatening illness and the need for diagnostic testing. Why should you look at your patient? Stronger emotional bond, enhanced trust, strengthened empathy, and actually it's demonstrated that if you look at the patient, they have a lower desire for medical legal action. Now the world's literature for diagnosis by face is con confined to about four different papers. Two of them involve the chronic evaluation of acute coronary syndrome. This is not presenting with the, uh, illness or presenting with symptoms. It's patients that were basically following up to have an elective cardiac catheterization done. And it turns out that people that ended up having flow limiting stenosis look more pissed off. So I told you that when it gets to the bottom line of trying to describe the affect that tells us if a patient is sick, that it isn't exactly very easy to pinhole like a pearl to tell you. But if you've got acute coronary syndrome, you'll look more angry. The other thing that we did was look at patients undergoing CTPA and the single thing that we found that I can tell you as a take home point is patients who ended up with a real emergency had a blunted affect. Less emotional variability that the doctor noticed and that we recorded on video. So a relatively flat or neutral affect. The way we do this is this thing uh, called the Noldis Space Reader, and we take a video and put it on this computer, and um, if you run this thing in real time, you can see that spider web that's planted on the patient's face. It gives us this thing called a valence index of, of the patient's overall facial expression with that wiggly line at the bottom, and then it'll give a pie chart of the relative emotional content of the patient's faces. 
So this is a way of scientifically trying to convert affect into a diagnostic tool and then try to teach it to emergency physicians. And of course, I have uh, great collaborators, including facial affect experts, and an expert in terms of converting this information into a visual format that physicians can understand, and that's Dave Schreiger, who's uh, the chair of emergency medicine at the Ronald Reagan Hospital in, in Los Angeles. He's actually my competitor at Annals of Emergency Medicine. Uh, he's an editor, uh, so a deputy editor there. But we publish and collaborate together, and we fight like crazy. So, but we get along. Um, here's something that we found. We wanted to know if physicians were faked out by smiles, and it turns out they are. We asked the question out of 208 patients undergoing CT scanning. Um, we asked physicians whether or not they perceived that their patient smiled during the physical exam, and then we asked them to give us their Gestalt and their Wells score. And we also videotaped all the patient's faces and applied them to the Noldus computer device to ask the computer, did you see a smile, in addition to what the doctor found. So what we found is that patients who were PE positive, now get ready for this, were more likely to smile than people who were PE negative. And you might say, what? They have clots in their lung. Their lungs are clogged up. Well, I'm going to go back to that case where I was reading about the fluctuating symptoms, and I'm going to tell you what I know as a topic expert and having interviewed hundreds and hundreds of patients with pulmonary embolism. They feel really crappy, and a lot of times when the doc walks in, they're feeling better. And you know what? They're happy they're feeling better, and they're also happy that they are being taken seriously. And you'll see them give a reciprocity smile or this thing called a Duchenne smile, which is really just a politeness. I just want to, I want to tell you, doctor, that I am happy that you're here today. It's not because I feel good. It's a smile that says, I'm just happy you're taking me seriously. Now, are there micro expressions underneath that some of you are really good at being able to look at and say, that wasn't a real smile? Probably, but it turns out it's not all of us, not at all. So the smile faked out the doctors and worsened their ability to be able to estimate the pretest probability using the Wells score. If you look at the two receiver operating characteristic curves on the left, the one that's lower were people who smiled, and the one that's upper and has the better area under the curve were the people that didn't smile. What happened is when docs saw patients smile, they were more likely to assign an alternative diagnosis more likely. They couldn't tell you what the diagnosis was, but it faked them out. So smile can undermine pretest probability. Over on the right is Gestalt, and if you just ask for them to give a, one to one, a zero to 100% probability, they didn't really get faked out as much. But for the binary question of alternative diagnosis more likely, smile got them to say yes for people that were PE positive. So to find out more about whether we're good at this, we took 75 patients undergoing CTPA testing, did that Noldus face testing, videotaped the patient's face watching a standardized sim stimulus, and then gave the videos to physicians and asked them to tell us whether or not the patient's face made them think the patient was more or less sick using a sliding scale. We also asked the doctors to tell us their ability to recognize facial emotions using a standardized instrument called the Danba scale, which has been around for about 40 years. So they gave us a visual analog scale before they saw the face and after they saw the face, and everyone got a standardized history. So what they were looking at was like this. Over on the left is the standardized history. Give us your visual analog scale of sickness. Now you get to see the patient's face. Repeat the visual analog scale. One of the most surprising things that I found about this is that a third of doctors were really good at it. A third, they didn't even use the face at all. They wanted that history, and they were actually more likely to be internists. And then a third got worse, looking at the patient's face. We then went in and asked people in cognitive interviews about what they thought of this process. And not surprisingly, the third that were good at it said it was fun, and the third that were not good at it described it as grueling. They did not like looking at these faces to make decisions. And when you did these 75 cases, by the time you were done with it, it was kind of like working a shift, even though it was virtual and you weren't signing charts and you didn't have a nurse tugging at you about the next Dilaudid order. 
it was still difficult and cognitively burdensome, but it was particularly bad for people that weren't good at it, which makes me wonder whether we should have better cognitive te pre-testing for people that go into emergency medicine because that lower third are the ones that I'm afraid are burning out in emergency care because they're just not good at reading people. The other thing was that, um, in general, we're not that good at looking at uh, faces and using them as a diagnostic test. If you look at this, at this uh, plot here, over here on the left are patients that cause the doctor to lower their pretest probability, and there's a lot of sickness here. In general, sick patients fake the patient, fake the doctors out, especially one or two of the pulmonary emboli that are there in red. And uh, this one was another patient who smiled, and this one was a patient who smiled while watching the video. So smile can sometimes fake us out. So in summary, about looking at patient's affect as part of overall building of empathy, noticing your patient's affect can clearly ex strengthen the socio-emotional relationship. And while illness does reduce spontaneous valence variability, it sometimes can be misleading and not everyone is good at it. So they have to use analytical thinking because intuition can sometimes misread, mislead people. So the next hypothesis that I wanted to talk about, which is what I'm going to spend the next 10 years of my life studying, which is how we can actually teach cognitive empathy at the bedside that allows some people who aren't so good at intuition to still be a really good doctor and to be able to work for 20 years and not burn out after 10 years. And that's the idea that increasing empathy can make you a better doctor. And this is a 10 uh, center project. These are the people that are working on it. Um, West Coast needs a little bit of uh, strengthening, but a good bit of representation on the East Coast. And the basic methodology is we've gone and obtained patient input on what we need to do to be more empathic doctors that patients trust. We did a multi-center survey of patients undergoing low-value CT scanning, and these were patients that the physician admitted they thought it was unlikely the CT scan was going to show a true emergency. We asked the patients about their empathy and trust in their doctors, as well as group-based medical mistrust. This is a primarily looking for underrepresented minorities' opinions. And also to tell them to tell us the phrases and words they want their physicians to use. And then we conducted three focus groups of patients across the United States, Los Angeles, Dallas, and Indianapolis, to develop a training tool for our physicians. Just a couple of results about empathy, trust in physicians, and group-based medical mistrust from left to right. The left-sided scale is the Jefferson scale for uh, patient perception of physician empathy. The one in the middle is the patient trust in physician scale. And the one on the right is the group-based medical mistrust, which talks about or asks questions about whether or not I feel that the group that I belong to is essentially discriminated against by the medical establishment. This is nine different hospitals. I'm just showing you this to recognize that in general, there was pretty good parity for both the perceptions of empathy and trust in physicians. But when it came to group-based medical mistrust, there were a couple of hospitals that were worse off than others. But in general, we're doing okay with patients' perception of empathy and trust with a few outliers. With race, um, not surprisingly, skipping over to the right-hand side, non-white patients had a worse, which is higher, group-based medical mistrust score. But despite the fact that uh, non-white patients had a mistrust for the medical establish establishment in general, they are able to overcome that belief and grade their physician based on his or her physician's merits and ended up having trust in physician and JSPPE empathy scores that were almost slightly higher than non-white than white patients were. And to me, this was a very uh, touching and powerful statement that even though people may mistrust the medical establishment, they're going to override that mistrust by judging each physician on his or her own merits. This is the result of the gender of the patient. And uh, this has been kind of found before, but not exactly. We found that women are a little tougher on emergency physicians in terms of both their uh, empathy and trust. So uh, women require some special attention, maybe because most emergency physicians are men, and maybe the type of reassurance that we're providing is not exactly correct. 
no difference in group-based medical mistrust by gender. And by education, this is somewhat paradoxical to me, but the least educated patients had the highest trust and highest empathy. The category with the worst performance for our physicians were white women of higher education. The theoretical construct of our phrase content was based on multiple domains that were well researched and considered across a, a bunch of different um, experts in terms of a Delphi approach, but they really had these three, these bullets you could look here and see that they represented about a whole person approach, medical competency, outside components, medical risk and error, compassion, cognitive reassurance, and individual preferences. And we constructed these phrases, as you can see here, and asked the patients to rank them in order to tell us which ones were most important to developing empathy and trust. And you can see the phrases here. And this is the result. The take home message is patients want to hear more about the fact that we've considered them as a whole patient rather than a disease with a simple phrase. And I found this to be extraordinarily powerful with my interactions with patients is I've considered everything that you've told me today. I've looked at you. I've thought about your vital signs. I know your past medical history. I've seen everything that I think I need to say. And I think that your passing out spell today is something we call vasovagal syncope. It's actually a marker of health. It's something that some people have and they're just normal. I don't think we need to do any more testing and I think today you're gonna to be all right. Telling patients about the whole picture, the whole patient is the way to go. And it, this is backed up by this evidence. We also asked them for ver verbatim comments which back this up. They want to have the situation explained to them and they want us to be transparent. Focus group results, very similar findings. And I'm gonna to point to one phrase that was made by an African-American woman in Los Angeles down here that's a very simple embodiment of the whole person. She said, if I come to the ER with a broken arm, you only see the broken arm, you don't see me. The same thing goes for chest pain or TIA or shortness of breath. The patients want to be seen as a whole person. This is a mix of both cognitive and affective reassurance. As a result, we've developed this training tool we call the ETRAX training system that we've now deployed and tested in six sites in the United States. This is the tool, and we call it the empathy circle, and it roughly puts things in the order that the patients told us that they thought were most important, and I'll just give you an example. The patients always refer to coming in warm and knowing my history. So that's the cool thing. The only cool thing about electronic health records, at least in the United States, is you can click up and look at their past medical history and know something about them and walk in and say, I, I, real, I know you're a dialysis patient, uh, so tell me about, how, wh about your shortness of breath. So they really do like that we have the chance to see something about their past history. Um, I am here for you. It's almost a verbatim phrase that I saw when I was Ottawa, in, in Ottawa that the Ottawa hospital uses. And maybe somebody could tell me what the exact phrase was, but it's like, I think it might even be, I am yours. And then it's in French also. You are in my care. You are in my care. You are in my care. Exactly. And I love that phrase. And that was complete. I saw that last year when I was there. And that was after I had done this work. It's completely independent and it's exactly concordant. And that's why I say think empathy is really on the rise in, in medicine in general, because this is what the patients want. No matter how busy it was, how crappy the waiting room was, when you walk into the room and say, I am here for you, you can overcome all of those prior biases that the patient has, including even group-based medical mistrust. So we've done this, this intervention where we've measured empathy as perceived by six or more patients for residents prior to the intervention. Three hospitals got the intervention, three hospitals did not. And then we followed up with the, we're in the process of following up and getting the patient's perceptions of empathy three months later. The intervention consists of a didactic and importantly, we text the, the residents before their shifts with one of 30 different texts that reminds them of tricks and trades to be empathic. And these things are, are simple statements like, remember you are a force of good simple enlightening phrases that remind them that it's going to be a tough shift but you're a great person these are some pearls that i have for anyone and this is what i like to do shake everyone's hand in the room the patient last sit down look at the patient's face ask out loud to see their texts 
text, mess, text messages can be incredibly informative at the bedside, especially when there's two people there and the one of the people is trying to tell you all of the history. I can't tell you how many medical malpractice cases I've seen, probably dozens, where part of the, part of the discovery are the texts between the husband and wife, and they say something like this. Um, I'm, come, I'm driving home from the ER, dear. Oh my, didn't they keep you? No. Did you tell them about your leg? They didn't ask. But you were complaining of your leg like crazy yesterday. It was hurting you. Well, it didn't hurt today, and they didn't ask. But did you tell them that you got short of breath when your leg quit hurting? They didn't ask me. They said I just needed to take some Tylenol. And you read these texts, and then the patient dies the next day, and the texts just literally floor you as a human being. I never don't want to know about texts like that. So I ask my patients nicely, I, it seems like you guys communicated. Do you mind if I see the texts that you showed? I'm not saying this is going to be right for every single patient, but it's something that I use, and I've found it to be extraordinarily empathic and, and empathy building. I'm not saying just walk right in the room and say, let me see your texts. I'm saying, you know, <laughs> sit down and get to know them. You might find some pictures you didn't want to find. And then another simple one is ask, is there anything else? This does not lead to uh, interminable um, a visit. You will, they will actually shorten their visit if you just ask them. And so this is what we found so far, and this is in the intervention group compared to the group that did not get the intervention. An improvement in, in patient perception of empathy, patient trust in physicians, and importantly, this is my most important slide of the talk, this is the physician's reported percentage of CT scans that they did that they thought were completely worthless. And that almost is cut in a third. And that's a real finding. If we can just cut some of that low-hanging fruit, that eight or so percent of scans that we know are a waste of time, I feel like I've done something. And we need to go after that even more vigorously. Other innovations that I'm personally working on that I think matter in terms of developing empathy, I've said for years we need an empathy dog, you know, a dog that has a little vest on that I can bring in with the patient that I'm having a hard time with. I mean, I would bring the empathy dog in for the patients I like, and the ones I don't like, I'd bring an empathy cat in. Um, but uh, the, the dogs can make an amazing, and if you have animal-assisted therapy in your, in your emergency department, it can make a profound influence, and it has multidimensional effects. One of the things that the, that, the fee, that the canine offers that none of us, no one in healthcare can offer in the emergency department, and that's affection, emotional affection. In fact, if you show emotional affection, you get fired. But the, do the dog can do it just fine, and many patients want that. We just uh, executed a study where we gave the dogs to the patient, and we're now in phase two where we're giving the dogs to the doctors. In both cases, testing if the dog increases the patient's perception of empathy. We just randomized 80 patients to a dog or usual care, did, me did measurements at 30 and 60 minutes. And then here are some data. This is a word cloud from the patients of what they had to say. And uh, these, are, these are patient reported measures of anxiety, depression, and pain. And everything went down with exposure to the dog. Their perceptions of empathy, trust in physicians concordantly went up. 40 patients with dog, 40 patients with usual care. And this is what I'm talking about going out of the box to improving empathic communication. In K92, we're giving the dogs to the doctors and randomizing them to either art therapy or the dog and testing their salivary cortisol and their stress response, uh, self-reported stress responses. Now this is the control and it's mindfulness using um, what are called Mandela coloring for five minutes on shift. And you might look at the one on the top there. Um, we're, we're anxious to see which one the doctors pick. And there's a sub-study with a bet that I'm pretty sure it's going to be the top one. And by the way, this was IRB approved. <laughs> so this is the end of my talk. And the summary that I have to say is that we're going to save more lives and waste by nurturing our innate ability to understand the patient perspective than we will by using any decision, rule, test, or technology. And it really is that the easy thing is the hard thing sometimes, or the other way around, the hard thing is the easy thing to be able to recognize the patient's physiology. It's not D-dimer adjustments. It's not using the year score. It is about what we do at the bedside. And this reminds me of Robert Heinlein's statement, specialization is for insects, 
empathy is for everybody. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. Speaking of empathic communication, I'm happy to hear your perspectives. I think we have a mic there and there. Do we have any questions? Well, you, you put one, uh, one concept uh, into perfect words for me, and, and that's the cognitive empathy, because what I've, what I've always tried to tell uh, residents and medical students is that the most important thing in establishing a pretest likelihood is they have to understand what the patient experienced, but I've never had it explained in the same terms that you did, so that's really helpful to me. I can, I can speak to medical students slightly more clearly now. Um, Howard? Uh, yeah. Whoa, that's loud. Sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Great talk. I just wanted to go back to the issue of not talking about colleagues' errors. While certainly gossipy, schadenfreude-laden kind of talk is destructive, isn't silence also a bit dangerous? Shouldn't we talk about it in order that colleagues can support, empathize with their colleagues who are going through a tough time? I, I think that's a great uh, improvement on what I had to say. We should talk to people's faces and say, that must have sucked. You, you, I know you thought that was a penetrating stomach ulcer or a penetrating posterior ulcer. I, I might have missed it too. Tell me what's going through your mind rather than talk behind people's back. I think it's simply being man or woman enough to face the person that made a mistake. And it's, it's almost like a grieving process and just saying this, this must be really hard on you. Something simple that is supportive but gives us a chance to discuss the error so it's not repeated. And, and we've all can share our own errors at the same time. Oh, by the way, speaking of errors, I want, I want, to, show, I want to show you this. Yeah, this is a great error, and I should have mentioned this. Speaking of error, thank you, Howard, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you an error. There it is. See the lady off to the left? I'm dyslexic. Yeah, off to the left. She looks pretty mad, doesn't she? You know why she's pretty mad? Because I sent her out with her PE. And she came back the next day. She was fine. But, um, yeah, y'all's PE expert sent me out. I've talked to her about it. So it happened. She was hyperthyroid, wasn't taking her medicine. Blah, 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 blah. I've got all the reasons why I sent her out. I make mistakes, too. And I still am not over that. I still have problems with that I made that mistake. We can talk about it during the break, if you like. <laughs> Just take a question from the other side. Yeah. Uh, th thanks, Jeff, uh, for the Dr. wonderful, Bain. wonderful talk. Um, it's just a fresh breath of fresh air, and as well as recalibrating ourselves as our specialty goes more and more into um, uh, technical imaging, hi-fi stuff. Yet, the patient right in front of us is the most important thing and the connection between us is what makes the difference. Thank you, it was just a comment. Thank you, Wayne. Way back there. So actually, I do have a question related to, I think, what the other person was alluding to. Uh, so, you know, in the face of evolving technology, but also very intense systems with the electronic health record, it actually has imposed a little bit of a barrier of how much time we actually can spend looking at the patient. And so how do you see the work that you're trying to do integrating in the face of the increasing impact of the EHR? I think the simple answer I have are scribes. Scribes, but they cost, don't they? I know, and I, that's, not a, that's a very American thing, I think, but in Canada, I don't know how many people have scribes as part of the routine clinical care. Yeah, might not be a great solution here, but I bet you've got a lot of people that want to go to medical school and they make, they make great scribes. I think you can still do it with the medical record. I think it's just a couple of simple body postures and not turning your back to the patient when you're looking at the medical record um, like many of our physicians do. Um, many of you have a physician, and I bet your physician is turning his or her back to you. So uh, just maintaining looking at the patient's face. I think that's another thing is learning to be able to use dictation as soon as you walk out of the room rather than, um, you know, typing in front of the patient. 
um, this, is, this is a skill and it needs to be reinforced to stop looking at the medical record and start looking at the patient's face. There's actually a, a systematic review that's demonstrated that patient's perception of us is inversely proportional to the time that you're looking at the um, medical record. Over to the other side. Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for that great talk. Uh, I'm wondering how your uh, work with other disciplines within the emergency department might help to improve one's empathy. Perhaps that's by getting the nurse's opinion of how the patient's doing their gestalt uh, or, or uh, other strategies that you might suggest. I, I think that's a great un unmet area. Is the big gap between us and nursing. Um, for what it's worth with K92, we're actually bringing the nurses in and we're trying to de-stress them together with the doctors and involving them as part of the team. And we think with this, that simple, like you're part, we're all part of the same team, we're seeing improvements because of collaboration. Um, unmet area, it really needs to be studied better with schools of nursing that are much more interested in science than they used to be. So I, I see that as up and coming. And that's with, uh, by the way, my wife is a nurse and is a researcher and is here with me and it's, today's our 26th anniversary. So, um, you know, I'm a, I, have a, I have a very a great fondness for nurses and their, their value in research. So thank you for that comment. Uh, Dr. Klein, thank you so much for a very uh, illuminating talk. Uh, my question is about, um, so with regards to the diagnostic error and then you brought up some slides about backgrounds about patient. So this is more about a question about your personal pearls. You know, often we have patients that speak a different language or come from a different culture, um, and especially the ones that are perhaps too deferential to doctors. You know, you're speaking to them, they're just saying, oh, yes, doctor, of course, doctor. And how do we avoid um, missing the diagnosis in those patients where, you know, maybe we have to push a bit further or pay attention more to those non-language empathic cues. That's, that, that's the real uh, bent of my question. Yeah. Man, um, so you're prescient. Um, I run a thing called a K-12 training program in the, in, at my hospital. This is a place, this is a thing where um, physicians can come and do emergency care research. It's funded by the federal government. My next K-12 scholar is Jacqueline Hernandez. She is a, English is a second language physician, and she's going to study that very concept in Spanish speaking patients to understand if their diagnosis is delayed and whether or not in cognitive interviews they believe they were ever heard correctly over the phone, you know, the phone translation, and whether the language itself causes that failure of empathy. I, I don't know how it couldn't. It, it has to have caused some degree of failure. And then we need to have a reasonable solution around it that's probably a technological solution, but I don't know what it is. Often I find it, it's almost easier if the patient pushes back a little and they try and um, inform you that you've missed something or you haven't listened to a particular aspect of what they're telling you. But a patient from those cultures or speaks a different language are more likely just yeah, to be perhaps a bit more passive. And I'm I, just, you know, what's the way to overcome that from our end? I've been in this, the empathy side of things now for about seven years and I'm really still learning. I would like to be somewhere 10 years from now where I can begin to address that question. And I'm just gonna share one with you. In Charlotte, we had the Mountain Yard. These were the mountain people from Vietnam that came to the United States as part of the deal because they fought on our side. And nobody could translate them, nobody. The only person you could talk to was the seven-year-old kid who was maybe or maybe not translating. And you would say, does she have any diarrhea? And there would be this long discussion that lasted about five minutes with lots of arguing and gesticulation. And the seven-year-old would turn to you and say, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about, right? And I have no idea how to convey empathy in that other than affect and looking and, <laughs> and seeming interested and looking at the nonverbal, which is a big part of the communication. I think that's the only answer I have right now. Thank you very much. Okay, Great this, point. This would be the last question. I think we have about one minute and then we need to get out of here. I'm curious about how this relates to changes in brain science around things, especially autism spectrum disorder. A lot of the things that you're talking about are the core deficits in autism, this cognitive empathy, face blindness, that kind of stuff, which to me is also in opposition to what you're saying about how we make those type two errors because we want to be part of a group. I'm not sure that it's the same physicians who are making the errors of 
over testing because we see and notice what all our colleagues are doing as the ones who are not interpreting correctly the facial expressions of our patients. How are you controlling for that thinking difference amongst emergency physicians? I'm just now getting into it enough to even understand that. Let me make one quick comment about the role of, of, of empathy in terms of brain function. FMRI shows that if we're able to, con to convert to an empathic way of thinking, many more parts of the brain light up. We basically become much more cognitively engaged. The cingulate gyrus seems to be the place where the lesion is that people can't do this. And it can be overcome to some extent by a different use of different uh, of, um, different parts of the brain. I am not a neuroscientist, and I'm going to need to have more collaboration to really understand exactly what you're talking about. I think what you're saying is there's two different causes of error, and there's those that just are kind of lazy and want to go along and not really think for themselves, and there's those that would like to, but are maybe because they're on the spectrum, unable to. And I think we're just now getting to the point where we can even ask those questions. This is a nascent science. It's something that should have been studied 40 years ago, and I think it's just getting started. Thank you for the comments. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Dr. Klein for being here today. And uh, I think if anyone else has any questions, maybe come up to the front. I imagine he'll be here for a couple minutes. Thank you. And I'll just remind everyone, we've got some really great tracks today. So uh, don't skip out and leave for home just yet. Uh, take advantage of some of the offerings uh, for the next couple of hours. <laughs>